Welcome everybody uh, to this week's Students Talk Back Political Lunch Panel Discussion. Uh, for those of you who I haven't had the chance to meet before, my name is Dan Schnur, and I'm the director of the Jess Unruh Institute of Politics here at USC. And we sponsor these lunch programs every week. Um, and some weeks we sponsor them with the Political Student Assembly for our Political and Policy Roundtable Discussion. But this week, this week, as we do frequently, this is a program that we co-sponsor with the College Democrats and College Republicans, and with our friends at the Daily Trojan, our Students Talk Back panel discussion. And as is our habit, whenever we do a Students Talk Back panel, is we put together a panel, as you can see, with two student experts and two off-campus guest experts. The first thing we're going to do is ask you to guess which two of the four people on the panel are the students, <laughs> which are the off-campus guest experts. So David, I think hair. that's right. Hey. Hey. David, I think you can pass. But we'll see. Oh, okay. um, today's discussion is going to be on the future of California's and the U.S. economy, with a specific focus on the debate over whether, when, and how uh, to raise our minimum wage. And for that discussion, we've got uh, a really terrific panel. I told you about them more broadly, but let me introduce them to you more specifically. Uh, sitting immediately to my right uh, is Doug Herman. And Doug is one of the most respected Democratic political consultants and strategists, not just in the state, but in the country. He runs the West Coast office for a very respected consulting firm called the Strategy Group. And he served as the chief mail strategist for Barack Obama's 2008 and 2012 uh, presidential campaigns. And he's also been a lead advisor to a whole range of California labor efforts here in LA and statewide. And Doug, we're very, very happy to have you. Thank you. Let's skip over Sarah for just a second and go to our other guest panelist, for those of you who didn't guess. Um, uh, sitting two down from Doug is our friend David Englund. Uh, David currently serves as the Executive Vice President for the Los Angeles County Business Federation, also known as BizFed. And so essentially, he runs uh, a diverse and successful and formidable grassroots alliance that unites and amplifies the voice of business here in the greater Los Angeles region. Uh, he previously served as the Director of Advocacy and Communications for BizFed, and also, prior to coming to California, served as a, member of the Cali uh, as a member of the Virginia State Legislature in that state's House of Delegates for, s delegates for six years, between 2006 and 2012. Just as well respected on the business side of the discussion as Doug is on the labor side, David, we're very happy to have you here today, too, as well. Yay! And if you heard that yay, that's because Alyssa used to work for him, and she's, <laughs> she thinks she still has to do that. <laughs> Um, and then, as always, uh, we have not one but two phenomenal student panelists uh, sitting in between uh, Doug and Dave is Sarah Donna Patana, who serves as one of the leaders in USC's College Republican Club, and at the end of the table is Jessica Yu, who is currently one of the leaders for USC College Democrats. Sarah, Jessica, thank you so much for joining us. And then finally, sitting to my left, as is the case for all of our students' talk back panels, we not only work in conjunction to plan the programs with the Daily Trojan, uh, but I have the great privilege of co-moderating these panels with one of the DT editors. And sitting right next to me is Sonali Seth, who's the DT's editorial director. <coughs> Sonali, thank you so much for being here with us again. Well, I'm going to kick off the questioning, and then Sonali and I will take about the first 20 minutes or so, the first 20 or 25 minutes, to ask questions of our panel. Then we'll open it up to questions from all of you. So for those of you who may not have attended one of these talkbacks in the past, what we'd encourage you to do is, in addition to listening to what the panelists have to say in the first half of the program, is to think about questions that you might have that you want to pose to them when the time and the opportunity presents itself uh, when, we get, when we get halfway through. Um, so I'm going to start with Jessica. And we're going to begin this, uh, the conversation more specifically on the minimum wage and then broaden it outward into a larger discussion of the economic issues. But as a representative of not only USC College Democrats, but a, a loyal Democratic voter and party leader, uh, Jessica, you've developed uh, a pretty strong level of support for an increase in the minimum wage. Maybe you can begin our discussion by telling us why you and your colleagues think that is such an important step. 
So I support the LA City Council's um, decision to increase the minimum wage because as the Democratic Party, we believe that raising the minimum wage will help millions of Americans living in poverty and working for inadequate wages. So according to NPR, an estimated 800,000 people in LA are living below the federal poverty line. And we think that by raising this minimum wage, it helps so many people get out of the, um, the poverty threshold. And it's really about taking care of basic needs and decency. The cost of living in LA is so high that we need to match our minimum wage to reflect that because people um, otherwise can't pay rent, they can't take care of the family. So it's really about getting them out of poverty and providing them that um, ability to thrive in this economy and the rising costs in LA. Great, so now let's hear a little bit from the other side. Um, and this question is specifically for David, who's worked a lot with business leaders in Los Angeles. Um, and I just want to ask, what are some of the concerns maybe with um, a minimum wage increase? Sure, well, um, first, it's always interesting because people really want to frame this discussion as you're for or against the minimum wage and even in your questions at the other side. And I would say that our members actually take a little bit more nuanced view of it. We represent, this Fed is a, is a massive grassroots coalition and we represent uh, about 150 business groups that collectively represent 275,000 employers throughout LA County. And we survey our members every year on what issues they are concerned about and we, the last couple of years, we've included questions about the minimum wage in the survey and what was really interesting is about 60% of our members told us that they didn't, they were not concerned and really didn't care if the minimum wage increased. Of uh, about 20% that are included in that 60% said they thought raising the minimum wage might actually be good for their business. So, um, so it's a, so it's, especially in California where the, the general cultural baseline is much farther to the left than the rest of the country. Um, I think that the business community broadly is, uh, is a little less black and white on some of these issues. But among that minority of our members who are concerned about the minimum wage, they're very passionate about it and very concerned about it. And they are retailers, uh, restaurant owners, and in particularly retailers and restaurant owners, but um, some other small businesses who are concerned about um, their very small margins and making the bottom line. One of the biggest concerns we hear from those folks is, uh, is questions about whether or not they're going to have to reduce the number of jobs. And so, um, so we strongly agree that poverty is a major issue that we want to address. It's a question of how do you do it. And um, we would argue that raising the minimum wage is not mathematically the right approach to addressing poverty because uh, raising somebody from $10 an hour to $15 an hour when you're not doing anything about housing costs, transportation costs, all the other costs of living in LA is not actually lifting them out of poverty. It, it might make things a little bit better for them, but it's not really lifting them out of poverty. What we'd rather see resources put into is uh, education, training, job creation, the kinds of things that would take somebody from $10 an hour give them the education and training they need, ensure there's an economic environment where they have a good job to go into from that training, and then take them from $10 an hour to $40 an hour, or to a salary position where they might get some benefits and actually really be able to support a family. So that's, that's been a big concern of ours. Then additionally, just on the public policy approach to minimum wage, uh, we're very concerned about a city by city approach. You know, you had uh, the city of LA do it, then LA County did it, now this, and that just covers the unincorporated areas of the county, so you still have another 87 individual cities. And then uh, Long Beach is working on it right now. The problem with that is you set up, uh, you, you set up a patchwork of rules and regulations that businesses have to try and figure out how to follow, and you set up a disparity between neighbors where you might you know, live, live in one place, work in another, and have different wage rules, and you can literally have um, two businesses that do the same thing, but they're across the street from each other, across a jurisdictional line, and they have different rules they have to follow, so their employees make different rates. And so, as a matter of public policy, uh, it would probably be smarter to have whatever, whatever the rule is, a uniform wage across a larger region. So whether it's a regional minimum wage or a statewide 
minimum wage. Uh, so those are some of the kinds of discussions that, that we also have. Okay, thank you very much, David. So let, let, let's come to Doug Herman. Um, uh, Doug, as we heard from David, there's a, a range of opinions within the LA business community on the advisability of an increase in the minimum wage. And I think uh, that's David articulated what sounded to be like a pretty reasonable approach to this. Now, we set the, these programs up as discussions rather than debates, but what would you add, or what's missing from David's analysis that, uh, that you and your colleagues believe is important to keep in mind? Well, I think there's a couple of things. First, I'm gonna agree with David on one front, and that is the patchwork approach is no answer to minimum wage uh, uh, increases. It should be done on a statewide basis, it should be uniform, and there should be uh, no geographic variations, it should be standard. David, would you support a statewide law like that, or is that a red herring argument I, that you're using? I would say um, I am here wearing my BizFed hat, and our members have not our members have taken a position against the proposed statewide initiative, however, uh, against the initiative that is out there, but we also um, generally would support whatever the rule is, we would rather it be statewide. I think they don't necessarily like the rule being proposed, but they'd rather any rule be statewide. And Doug, just to be clear, your role is to answer the questions, not to ask them. <laughs> Sorry, but I don't mind. But in, it's a discussion. In the end, the minimum wage hike is not a poverty solution. It's part of the, the, the solution. It's not the solution. And you know, we've got a federal minimum wage stuck at seven twenty-five for years. We've got the California minimum wage, which is at nine dollars an hour, which does not get you above the federal poverty level. Uh, we need to increase this four red states in 2014. Alaska, Arkansas, Nebraska, and South Dakota all passed minimum wage initiatives. These are states that nobody would have bet on passing these things on the front end. Um, what we're seeing is the disparity between the pay at the top and the pay at the bottom has grown greater and greater while we've continued to stagnate and not raise the minimum wage. It has not kept up with inflation. Um, if you were to index it and put it where it needs to be, it would be in these areas that we're talking about with the initiatives that are being discussed to raise the minimum wage. So we're woefully behind the times, we're woefully behind the cost of living, and this is part of the solution, not the only solution to the poverty problem. So I think that's an interesting point, Doug, about this being part of the solution. And I know, Sarah, you spent a lot of time thinking about this problem, the minimum wage, and I just wanted to give you a chance to respond to some of the points that Doug made. So what do you think um, are other parts of the poverty solution and maybe some <coughs> concerns with this with this uh, specific minimum wage increase? Right, thank you. And I think David touched on this. Um, but I think it's really important to refocus our commitment on affordable housing, especially in Los Angeles. Um, I think what we're seeing is that um, the minimum wage increase seems like a great solution and it seems like you know in the moment we're really helping out these people get back on their feet and while I don't disagree with that I think if you're looking long term and looking at um, where the money is actually going and how much they're benefiting um, per household um, that you can kind of see that affordable housing plays a, a larger role in this um, in this scenario so I think as far as the housing issue, um, specifically in Los Angeles, we know that um, when we're getting this proposed $15 um, an hour minimum wage increase, um, there's also an issue with the supply of shortage of um, new housing developments. And I think the regulatory restrictions on infill and increase of housing developments have really um, pushed this discussion more so to not how can this increase in, of dollars in um, their paychecks really work over to them getting nicer homes or being able to uh, relieve their rent because now we're at the point where um, these people are unable to afford the cost of living and I think the biggest discussion for this proposed increase was the fact that we would be living in a, in a situation where we would have a living wage but I think now the discussion is not are we I guess the discussion is now, um, I guess, how, how are we really able to benefit these families? And at this point, I don't think we're benefiting these families if um, they're not able to afford the rent and if the, if the landowners are increasing rent because they know that the uh, minimum wage has been increased. 
Um, so I'd like to take this opportunity to kind of refocus um, the conversation sort of on um, past the minimum wage and uh, more about the broader challenges. And um, this question is specifically for David. Um, what challenges do you see, maybe nuanced challenges, that these um, that business interests often face? But in LA County and uh, California in particular, there is a significant impact of the, cum the cumulative, 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 sorry, I can't say that word today apparently, uh, effect of taxes, fees, and regulations. And um, what we see as a business community is any, and this fits into the minimum wage, any given public policy proposal, whether it's a new tax, a new fee, a new set of regulations, may in and of itself seem like a fine idea. But you have to consider how that interplays with the dozens of other taxes and fees and regulations that are being imposed and have been imposed, have been imposed and have that cumulative, cumulative effect. Um, and, uh, and our members identify that as a real challenge because um, many of them are not corporations that have you know, a whole HR department to deal with a new set of regulations or that have a compliance division uh, or an environmental compliance division, for example, to deal with every new um, environmental rule that comes out or planning department um, order that gets issued. And so it creates challenges for them growing their business, creating jobs, um, and frankly staying in the Los Angeles area. Now there are some businesses that really have no choice but to function here, and you have a whole service sector that, that will not leave, but they can reduce jobs, and that's one of the concerns where anything that, that cuts into the, the profitability and, and the ability to create jobs and pay those employees and give them the benefits, those are concerns. So that's a big area of concern, and that gets into things like, you know, California is, a, is, and rightfully so, a real leader on all environmental and air and water quality rules, but the way some of those rules have been historically implemented uh, at the state level, it, what it does is it sets up a system where uh, businesses or neighborhoods sue each other and it slows down development. And, um, and they sue each other over non, they use the environmental laws to sue each other over non-environmental things in order to get a competitive advantage. So one of the things we're working on is trying to reform some of those laws at the state level so that we can have strong environmental compliance, which is very important, while also getting rid of some of the litigation abuse, which we feel stands in the way of a lot of business growth and job creation. David, thank you very much. Uh, Sarah, y you began the broadening of this conversation by pointing out appropriately that minimum wage, a minimum wage increase is really only one very specific facet of a broader discussion of economic growth. You talked about housing as another uh, directly related component of that discussion. Since we've now broadened this out, maybe you can help us either by going back to housing or by identifying other related issues that you think are important for us to be talking about in this context. Um, so the PPIC, the Public Policy Institute of California, before the debate started, kind of framed the discussion in terms of looking at the typical family of four scenario um, at the poverty line making about $32,000 a year. Um, and in that, in that sense, they, were, they would be two parents working full time at about $9 an hour. And clearly this, um, this minimum wage increase would be a benefit to them, but I think we, have to kind of shift that mindset and look at the logic of um, how this prototype is not a one-fit-all type um, scenario and how um, I guess the primary workers or primary um, money money makers the, the primary um, household owners in in that scenario are not the ones that are bringing home I guess um, all of the money and so I think so they, they came up with statistics saying that about 30% um, of those people based on that prototype were 26 and then 19% work off commission. Um, and I think as far as moving forward and looking at other things to supplement, um, I guess, and fill in for the minimum wage increase and 
in opposition to it would be refocusing on um, education in terms of making sure that we can have um, cities that are growing and building um, a middle class that is able to move beyond that $10 or $15 minimum wage and that can move forward in terms of making $40 and growing in um, getting affordable college education and moving forward with bachelor's degrees. Um, so I think we can also place a heavier emphasis on education and how that can supplement um, growth. So we heard a little bit earlier um, from the, from David about the challenges that business interests face uh, when uh, confronting this issue. And um, I just wanted to ask Doug, um, from the labor organization standpoint, who Doug has spent a lot of time working with um, different labor organizations about some of the obstacles maybe that um, these organizations face when advocating for policy changes. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to respond to the, the broader comment about job training and, and assistance and, and all these kinds of programs for housing as other solutions. Um, it doesn't, it's not overlooked by me that the people who vote against these programs repeatedly time and time again are Republicans. And so when Republicans sit up here and say that we need more of this and then their elected officials go and vote against it, it's a bit of a hollow argument to me. Um, and I don't want to put too sharp of a partisan point that on I'm that. A Republican? I'm not doing that. I'm saying that the, it's it's a proxy for a Democrat and a Republican argument. And to hear the to hear the proxy Republican argument say that the solution is programs that Republicans vote against is hard for me to square. Um, so I just want to point that out. I mean, I'm not calling anybody to a task for that because there's no elected uh, uh, Republican officials here. David's retired, so nobody and, here. And feels just that. just to set the record straight, I was the vice chairman of the Democratic Caucus in the Virginia House of Delegates. There you go. So um, actually worked very hard to win Virginia for President Obama. So you. you're welcome. Um, <laughs> in, 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 the, in the broader context. In, case. <laughs> in the broader context. Um, the you know the, there's there's certainly challenges for the labor movement when advocating for their policies and for their programs and you know primarily uh, there's there's a big unknown of fear if you're unused to unexposed to or not have a, do not have an existing working relationship with the labor community and you're an elected official you may have concerns about them that are based on uh, bad preconceptions that are that are uh, misperceptions that um, you know is this labor uh, is considered a special interest and your view of a special this special interest is going to be determined by whether or not you think labor is fighting for the middle class <coughs> and to put working families in the forefront and to advocate for them or whether you see them as a uh, tax hogging, bureaucracy building, budget busting drain on our resources, and and those are two views that are out there of labor, and I'm I'm not advocating that um, they are that or that, that that they are this. There's fear and unknown, and so to paraphrase uh, FDR, really labor the the thing labor has to fear is itself, and and if you look at the newspaper today, there's a big story about competing minimum wage initiatives and division within the labor community and within um, a, a particular union uh, as to how to deal with this. And so I think labor's biggest challenge oftentimes is itself, and then the, the biggest challenge after that is the unknown and the fear that br that brings. Okay, well, thank you very much, Doug. And before we bring Jessica finally back into this conversation, just a, a couple of quick points. Um, one, each of the panelists has made the point in a slightly different way. And that's uh, uh, hearing them talk about the profound uh, sense of worry and apprehension that many Angelinos and many Californians feel about their own economic prospects and the prospects of the state economy going forward. And as it happens, shameless plug, our uh, newest USC Doran Sife LA Times poll will be coming out this weekend. And if you look at Sunday's Times or if on Sunday you go to the Doran Sife <coughs> website, you'll see our poll results um, on these very questions. What California, what Angelinos, what all Californians feel in terms of economic challenges going forward, um, as well as a whole range of other uh, potential impactors on their thinking, the impact of immigration on their economic well-being, uh, the impact of globalization, of technology. So we'd encourage you to look for those results. 
we now return you to your regularly scheduled <laughs> programming. Um, Jessica, I know you wanted to take this conversation uh, looking not just more broader, but looking forward. And of course, we're in the beginning stages of the 2016 presidential campaign, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on how these types of issues play out on the campaign trail over the next 52 and a half weeks. <laughs> sure, so. And you don't have to do it week by week, but just. Okay. You know. I think people are growing increasingly more frustrated with the apparent income and wealth distribution. So um, it's when people are frustrated and when they're riled up that it brings attention to national discourse and to these presidential candidates that um, something has to be done because we're at that point where, oh, thanks. Uh, we're at that point where a general frustration among the middle class can't be ignored anymore. So um, regarding the presidential election, I think a lot of Democratic candidates have brought it at the forefront of their campaigns. For example, um, Bernie Sanders, it's right there. Uh, that's his, you know, that's his drive, that's his um, kind of compelling ap um, aspect of his campaign. So I think that's gaining him a lot of traction because he's there to say, look, this is one of the issues that matters so much to us and that's why he's gaining so much momentum because he's bringing up this issue of income inequality and the need for job growth that other candidates aren't doing as much um, but overall, I feel like the Democratic candidates have a, a lot of overlap on what they want to do to solve income inequality and to spur job creation. For example, they're in favor of taxing the wealthy and the corporations, um, providing wage supplements and tax relief for the small business community and low income workers, raising the minimum wage, which was very apparent in the first half of our discussion, and regulating Wall Street. So. I think on the Republican side, um, it's definitely an issue, like they acknowledge it, but what I kind of feel is it's not the issue that is going to sell or like gain them votes. It's not the issue that's going to sell the uh, <coughs> campaign. So that's why I think Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton have been so prominent in bringing this issue to light. It's because they're advocating this issue and bringing it to national discourse that the other candidates have not. So I think it's very apparent that the Democratic Party is the most active and efficient in bringing the in issue of income inequality to national discourse. We're going to open it up to your questions in just a moment, but while well, we work very hard, as I think those of you know who come here regularly, to put together panels and discussions that are as balanced as possible, and certainly in the question of business and labor perspectives, that's exactly what we did here. Inadvertently, however, we seem to have isolated poor Sarah as one Republican on a panel, on a panel of, of, of three Democrats. Um, and what, what I will say, uh, not taking sides in this, but just uh, uh, to make a point that Sarah or a compatriot of hers would make if the panel were a little bit more even-handed, is whether you happen to agree with them or not. I think Jessica's analysis is an, is an excellent one, but I think whether you happen to agree with them or not, the leading Republican candidates have also laid out uh, a significant range of proposals in order to pro promote economic growth in job creation. Uh, we'll see in the campaign going forward which party's proposals uh, uh, resonate uh, more effectively with the American public. Without asking Sarah to run through all 14 Republican economic agendas, which, by the way, she is perfectly capable of doing when asked, but we don't have time for it, sorry. Um, it is worth noting that, that, that both parties' candidates are, of course, addressing this issue in, uh, in somewhat different ways. All that said, uh, let's open this up now. Um, questions from you guys for either a specific member of our panel or for the entire panel going forward. And for those of you who've been here in the past, you know that I make two requests of you when we call on you. One, number one, when we call on you, please tell us who you are so we know who's joining the discussion. And second, if particularly if you're going to ask a question of someone with whom you disagree, we ask that you frame that question with the same respect and regard that you'd want that person to show you if they were questioning you back. So, Nick, I see you chomping at the bit, but remember the conversation we've had about respect. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> so, my name's Nick. Um, I'm a senior political science major. I'm also a student staff worker at the Unruh Institute. Oh. Um, <laughs> And I just wanted to ask, um, I know that we kind of, this kind of follows up nicely with the three against one comment, um, but um, the LA uh, labor leaders, the unions, this question's probably best for Doug, but anyone can weigh in, um, about their efforts to kind of exempt themselves from the minimum wage 
um, mandate for the for union workers. Um, I was wondering if anyone could talk a little bit about the motivations for why they would do that, if it was strategic. Uh, just kind of talk about that a little bit and what, why, <laughs> why the rationale for that after they fought so hardly for the fifty dollars. And, and Doug, maybe what you can do for those people in the audience who haven't followed the debate as closely as you and Nick have is take a minute just to describe the the proposal and then to talk about the thinking behind it. And then, Dave, if you're interested in waiting, and also you're certainly more than welcome to. There are others who are probably better prepared to describe the proposal. However, the, the point that Nick is referencing was whether or not there would be an exemption allowed for uh, employees who are members of labor unions who have, in effect, benefits in addition to their pay that put them up over the $15 level and, in fact, have better benefits than if they were not in a union and whether or not uh, an organization who provides those opportunities to their employees should be exempted from having to pay the minimum wage to their employees. Um, I'll say uh, I believe that they should not have advocated for that principle. The theory behind it is that um, it allows and it creates an incentive for employees to join the labor union. If you're the labor union, this is 100% um, about building members and, and growing your membership, um, which is their objective. That's their job. The day in, day out, their objective is to keep and grow members. That's, that's the, <coughs> one of their major uh, goals. And so in that context, from a labor perspective, that's why they advocated for that exemption because it allows them the opportunity to work with an employer. Um, this is a, this is a private union situation generally. This is not a public employee situation. This is a private union uh, going to a, a business and saying, "We will make a deal with you that you will not be forced to pay fifteen dollars an hour if you will allow us to unionize or to grow our union and cover other departments, whatever the situation may be." In that context they're having with their employer, the conversation they're having with their employer, if you allow us not to, to, to pay the, the $15 per hour rate. Um, it's a trade. It's a straight up trade. Um, it may or may not be a fair trade. If the point is to, to start paying people and putting money in their pocket and raising the wages, then this is not in furtherance of that goal. If the goal is about giving people additional assistance and benefits and whether it's paid, paid leave for being sick or for vacation or extra uh, time off uh, in addition to whatever they've earned, those are the, the exemptions that they're asking for. And so that, that was the, the gist of it. But it seems to me that if the point is to raise the wage, you ought to raise the wage for everybody. So I would, did you wanna? Yeah, I would just say I, com I completely agree it, wholesale with Doug's analysis of that. I would just add that the, um, one of the business community's frustrations when that happened is one of the arguments we had been making all along was on the issue of total compensation. This is particularly important to, to restaurant owners. And this is the idea that, the, that tips are not counted as a part of the wage. So you could be on paper making a wage of less than minimum wage, but taking home well, well above minimum wage. So it doesn't make sense to force the restaurant to raise your minimum wage and we wanted to be able we wanted restaurants to be able to count those tips when you're calculating whether an employee is making that wage that's an example of that's an example of a situation where the employees have made an alternate arrangement with their employer that benefits them um, but the labor advocates were, were having none of that and and did not support that. Now, there's a, there was also some question as whether the city had the legal authority without state legislation to do that, so that was part of the discussion too. But um, when labor basically came in and started making the same arguments that the restaurants had been making about total compensation, but applying it to labor benefits, we just, we found that a little disingenuous and really frustrating. And at the end of the day, we came down on the side of you know whether businesses agree with the the minimum wage rate or not. Whatever rate it is, if it's good enough for a non-union employee, it should be good enough for a union employee. I mean, if it's fifteen dollars is what you want to pay people, it should apply to everybody. Thank you, David. Yes, question. Hi guys, uh, my name is Katie, and I know a few of you mentioned that you don't think it would be a good idea to change the wages, like 
um, I guess regionally, like it should be like a statewide thing. Did I get that correct? Um, so I was just wondering, I come from Texas, a small town where the minimum wage is actually pretty close already to a living wage. I'm um, referring to the federal minimum um, wage. But then you go a few hours over to Dallas and it's not even close. So I wonder how you think those sort of issues could be addressed. Um, if you raise the minimum wage uh, to a living wage in Dallas, it might do bad things to small towns where it's quite different. And, and, and David, this goes back to the point that you were making a little bit earlier about how if municipalities fairly close to each other geographically have different levels of minimum wage, that that can lead to uh, 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 that can lead to a skew in terms of job attraction and retention. Yeah, and that's been one of the interesting arguments about doing a statewide minimum wage in California is um, some people have argued, well, you know, maybe it, maybe it makes sense to do that in the LA area, which is very high cost of living, but do we really need to give people in Bakersfield that degree of a wage increase because their cost of living there is so much lower? Um, you know, it, frankly, that that's an uh, interesting argument and a challenging piece of that public policy. And so it's a, I think it's a trade-off. Um, there, I think a lot of people would say that there's, there are real benefits in terms of how you, how you administer public policy and how you, how you enforce it and how you run, run your business by having a consistent set of rules of, of, of a large area. And so maybe the fact that you know somebody might be getting a little more that you're not intending is, is worth that cost. You know that that's an interesting discussion to have. Um, but I, I would I would say it also I think a, a companion issue is how we measure poverty, and we still you know 60 years later do not do a good job of actually measuring true poverty. And I know measuring that poverty. I'm sorry to interrupt, David. Is probably going to have to be a panel discussion for not just. Another day, but Whole another issue. week or month. We'll set aside spring <laughs> <Yeah>. semester uh, <laughs> for discussion on uh, measuring and alleviating poverty. Uh, in the in the meantime, though, hi, uh, my name is Ryan. I am a senior here, and I am actually also representing the College Republicans. So, someone else here on that side. Um, my question is for Douglas. It was because you mentioned that Republicans will not vote for the programs that are meant to substitute for the minimum wage increase, and. Uh, I just wanted to clarify the fact that this is like a political game of bipartisan demands for sure. It's why they won't vote for these because they realize the minimum wage is probably going to be increased regardless. And so they're really, what they're trying to do is aim for the lesser of two evils. Like that's the saying, like neither of these are evil, obviously they're here to help people. But why vote for the one if you know the other one's going to pass anyways? And then you not only are giving the government more control, which the conservative mindset usually doesn't want, but you're also like sort of losing the battle twice. Um, I, I, I have to respectfully disagree with the framing that um, these things are linked and that there's a connection between um, voting against job training programs because the minimum wage is going to get passed in three years from now. I mean, there's a, there's a track record over years and years of history at federal and state levels across this country showing Republican voting patterns consistently against these kinds of programs um, despite and in absence of a minimum wage effort. Only recently has the minimum wage uh, bandwagon really started rolling in the last couple of years. The fight for 15 that SEIU has been pushing in particular has been the, the impetus behind this. And so there's a long period of time and a disassociation from the minimum wage effort and these votes. Um, I think it's very difficult to link those two together and saying it's going to come, it's going to happen, so I'm going to vote against this. Um, they're not, they're not at all um, linked in my mind. Lots of lo lo lots of other questions, uh, though. Again, not to take sides in this debate, but to uh, make sure the conversation uh, stays as even-handed as possible. Once again, if, uh, if if Sarah's side were to be more heavily populated on the panel, another counterargument, Ryan. Uh, that you might hear uh, in addition to the one you made is a lot of Republicans would argue that job training ought be provided uh, but should be provided um, by private sector employers looking to train individuals to work for them as opposed to as opposed to through the government that's not me taking a side saying that's a better or worse alternative than Doug's just pointing out the contours of the debate yes over here um, hi, my name is Grayson Peltier. I am a junior majoring in political science. 
Um, my question is in regards to raising the minimum wage and the impacts that would have on um, students graduating from college or students who graduated from high school looking for a job, not going to college. Um, and there are statistics already showing that higher, co higher um, wage costs and um, higher minimum wages lead to um, less experienced workers, less experienced, especially younger workers, having problems finding jobs and that um, if your wages and your uh, work experience are lower really early on in life, that that tracks with you for the rest of your life. So how would you um, approach and mitigate uh, the issue of uh, crowding out younger workers and um, causing this lifelong decline in earnings that um, we tend to see with these types of initiatives, although well-intentioned in the now present, um, creeping into future effects? Several good questions in there. I guess the, the, the one that I would uh, pick out, and uh, Doug, I'd ask you to start with, and then if anyone else on the panel would like to weigh in, you're certainly welcome to, is does raising the minimum wage make it more difficult uh, or create an additional obstacle for a business to hire entry-level workers? In other words, if I have to pay you $15 an hour instead of $10 an hour, because you, Doug Herman, obviously have no skills whatsoever, <laughs> um, does it, can, you know, can I still afford to do so? Or do I hire fewer minimum wage workers because the minimum wage is higher? So the workforce is the workforce. And um, you know, I, it, just to deviate a little bit from your point, Dan, I, I think that the people who are applying for these jobs today are going to be the people who apply for them tomorrow and the people that apply for them next week, whether or not there's a minimum wage increase. It's the same person and it's the same group of people who are applying for these jobs. They're either at the beginning of their career or they're stuck in a rut or they've fallen on bad times and those are the people who are coming into these jobs. And regardless of what the minimum wage is, those are going to be the people who are filling these slots. And so. Um, I would also say that ultimately when you raise the minimum wage, you're rising all boats. A rising tide lifts all boats and the point of this is to put more money into the economy. The dry cleaners are going to have more business. The dry cleaning employee is going to work longer hours. There's a, there's a, there's a, a cascading effect that comes from these things and so I think that it will not limit their opportunity to hire more employees because their business will be growing because there's more money in the economy and they're all going to benefit and be beneficiaries of that. Uh, David, does the, does the question reflect a concern that you find among the smaller businesses in your organization, in your coalition? Well, I would say yes in terms of the way, Dan, you, you kind of framed the question and the way Doug uh, responded to it. That, that is a concern, the question of, with a with a finite set of resources the business has only certain a certain number of people that it can employ and if they have to spend more money per employee then there's a concern about um, the numbers of jobs they'll be able to retain or create but i would also say i think part of your question was was focused on um on youth employment and how and that on ramp into the workforce and that is something that our members as an organized business community are very concerned about because that those jobs you get as a 16 17 18 year old that's where you learn the soft skills that then set you up to be a really successful employee down the road whatever you do so uh, one of the things that we have advocated for knowing and being able to count votes and know, understand kind of the, the will of the public that these minimum wage policies are, are passing, um, we've been working to try and get exemptions for youth employees. And you, you know, you can. There's all kinds of debates about what is, you know, what what defines a, a, a young person for that context. And some people would would uh, set that age at higher than others. But the point is having some um, some allowable lower wage for those early couple of years of employment to create an incentive um, and remove a barrier for those young people to get into the workforce, learn those soft skills, and then once that time has passed, they'll, then the, the broader minimum wage policies would apply to them. So that youth exemption is perhaps a concrete 
answer to your question in terms of a, a policy that that we have advocated for to try and address that issue. Let's try to get in one more question and then we'll wrap up. Hi, I'm Brianna, um, sophomore majoring in political science. So how do you think that, this is for anybody, um, how do you think that the advent of it, like technology takeover of minimum wage, jobs that are typically minimum wage, low skill, how does that um, affect the discussion over minimum wage and should it affect the discussion? Question for, for any of the panelists. Um, a lot of jobs that were once entry level jobs are now being done um, uh, by machine or by computer. How does that affect uh, not only the minimum wage point that Graham is asking about, but how does, how does that affect the, the broader economic discussion? Uh, advances in technology, to give you a quick lumps to our, ahead to our USC Dorn Psych LA Times poll coming out on Sunday, we find that most Californians, in fact, find that advances in technology uh, have a market positive effect um, on their economic prospects. But it's also pretty clear that there are concerns about people being displaced from the workplace. Anyone? I'll, I'll offer a, a positive anecdote on this on, on a couple of fronts. The, the gigabit economy, as, as it's being referred to or has been referred to, Uber and Airbnb in particular, um, Uber is allowing folks to add income. You can be a driver, you can sign up to be a driver, you can add income, you can employ yourself, you can jump into the workforce as an Uber driver tomorrow, in effect, not literally, but you can start that process. You gotta go through a, a background check and a clearance, but you can become a Uber, Uber driver, and the same way you can put your home on Airbnb and you can start raising uh, revenue for yourself by renting out your your uh, housing and your lodging accommodations. Those are two areas where I think the, the technology economy is directly benefiting consumers in addition to all of the choices that, that come with that, the ability to call an Uber or a Lyft, the ability to go to Airbnb instead of uh, a big chain hotel. Those are great things for consumers and they're great choices and they put the power in the hands of the individual and take it away from the other folks. So I think that's a great uh, asset in terms of the technology. Uh, well, and we'll wrap up in just a minute, but a question to the, to the student panelists, uh, either or both of you that would like to take it. It seems to me that the rapid advances in technology uh, may create the gloss of, of some jobs but it creates other opportunities that didn't previously exist. And I would think particularly for a younger generation that's more savvy, that's more familiar with these technological advances than old fogies like David and, and Doug and myself, um, there is a net positive and not a, a net negative in terms of potential job opportunities for people who understand, these, uh, the, the, who understand the potential that these technological advances provide. Is that fair or am I being just too optimistic. I think that's fair. I mean, in terms of social media, if you look there, Instagram, find famous YouTube stars who are able to not exploit, but use these services to the best of their advantage. But I think it goes back to technology and using that for educational purposes. Um, if anything, that's something that I'm happy and excited for, for people who are or were unable to attend night class or attend a traditional everyday college um, course, they're able to work full time and also have that opportunity to use technology um, to better and kind of supplement what they're currently making. Um, so if anything, I think technological advances have had a net, um, I guess, increase in terms of helping out um, younger students and younger um, folks trying to make their way um, up the totem pole in terms of Jessica, last word either on this specific question of technology or on other things we've discussed over the course of the panel. Okay, so I'm from Silicon Valley, so very like tech heavy. Um, so personally, I do see that technology has helped economy and like Sarah said, like helping students um, navigate through like even <coughs> climbing up that total pool or like through their lives. I think it does add a lot of jobs and then um, it gives them a lot of opportunities, like saying Uber, Airbnb, um, using social media, even using um, online, I guess, like resources to, you know, purchase things. I think technology has opened up this huge um, realm that we can make purchases. So that definitely helps to increase the economy. And overall, I think it does bring a lot of jobs because our focus now is technology. Um, uh, technology is so useful in 
you know, providing new ways to do things more efficiently. So I think it does boost the economy and it also provides um, new ways for workers to learn more skills. Thank you, Jessica. Before, uh, before we thank our panel uh, uh, for this discussion, just a couple of quick notes. Uh, number one, if you found this conversation and this broader topic uh, to be an interesting one, whether more specifically on the question of a minimum wage increase or uh, the larger conversation about what it takes to create jobs and grow the economy in California. One more shameless plug, I will be teaching a class every Monday this spring, Poli Sci 325, called State Politics, the Future of California. And in State Politics, the Future of California, we'll be studying six of the state's most significant public policy challenges, starting with job creation and economic growth, but also talking about K through 14 public education, healthcare, criminal justice, transportation and housing, and energy and the environment. Again, that's PolySci 325. If you can't remember PolySci 325, Alec, I'm the only person in the department named Schnur, so. <laughs> um, a couple of other announcements for those of you who are thinking about a uh, potential internship opportunity for spring semester, that's PolySci 395. Tanya Mercado is sitting right here as our internship coordinator, and she has already begun uh, to set up interviews for uh, students looking at interning in the spring, whether it's on a campaign, obviously we're heading into an important election year, in the office of an elected official, we have internships in the office of the mayor, city council president, and in un any number of congressional and legislative offices around Los Angeles, as well as consulting firms, advocacy groups, and community-based organizations. If you're interested in interning for credit, come see Tanya. Uh, uh, obviously you don't have to sign up until January, but if you start now, we could probably help you get a much more uh, as attractive an internship opportunity as possible. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, we have to hold these programs every week, but uh, we do wrap up late in the semester because we know how unilaterally and obsessively you all focus on papers and finals and other end of the semester challenges. So next week is our final uh, lunch program of the semester. We'll have our legislative and political roundtable discussion talking about alternative energy opportunities in California. And we'll meet here for 11.30 lunch and a 12 to 1 p.m. panel discussion. Um, also, uh, for those seniors who are graduating, um, hopefully all the seniors are graduating, uh, for those of you who are graduating regardless of your year, um, one other thing that Tanya can help you with in our offices at the Younger Institute is to tell you about a phenomenal public service program for college graduates called the Coro Fellowship Program. And CORO is a one-year opportunity to work in public service in a range of uh, different areas. And she'd be more than happy to, to tell you about that as well. End of the commercials, let's go back to the main point, which is to thank our panel for what I think you'd agree was a fascinating discussion. So thank you to Jessica Yu, thank you to David Englund, thank you to Sarah Donna Fatana, and thank you to Doug Herman. You guys were great. We very much appreciate it. Thanks to my co-moderator, co Sonali Seth, and thanks as well to the team at the Unruh Institute for putting these programs together for us every week. Thanks very much to Tanya, thanks very much to Erica, thanks very much to Kat, but thanks especially to Alyssa and to Allie for the work they've done in putting these programs together for us all semester long. Yes. Thanks finally to all of you. Hopefully we'll see you here next Wednesday. Have a good day.